Hello, and welcome to the Inside Writing Podcast. I am your host, Josh Sippy. As a reminder, all of these episodes are recorded live, Wednesdays, 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Time. You can sign up on the Gotham Writers website for free. Now then, on to the show. Today, we're talking with Varud Gupta. Varud is the author of the graphic novel Chotu, A Tale of Partition and Love, and the nonfiction travel memoir Bhagwan Ke Pakwan, Food of the Gods. His food and travel articles have appeared in National Geographic and America's Test Kitchen, among others. And his short graphic fiction has appeared in Comic Sense and Ink Lab. He has worked as head of originals for the, for the production studio, Resting Kitch Face, and taught for the Indian Institute of Art and Design. Varud, welcome to the show. Hi there. I Thanks agree. for having Thank, me. Absolutely. Thanks for being here. So, Varud, we want to start with the, the breaking in point, since that's the theme of the season. Uh, w- was there a moment in your writing career where you felt like you'd really arrived, that you were doing what you wanted to be doing as a writer? No. Um, <laughs> I, I feel like that is a tough one. It's My introduction is very confusing, particularly because I've done so many different things. And now from food and travel to graphic novels, I'm working on my first like historical fiction novel. And so I feel like almost every project is starting from complete zero and then working your way back up again. Uh, I have one defining moment. And in the scheme of things, it probably means a lot less to many that might be listening in. But to me, it was just like that one moment meant a lot. Uh, my first project was an ebook. Um, it was an ebook on Argentinian barbecue, um, which is something like most people bizarre. Why is this Indian kid from Texas in Argentina cooking Argentinian barbecue? Uh, it was an ebook that uh, maybe a good 200 people actually picked up before I got really embarrassed of it and removed it. Um, 50% of which probably my family and friends. But about a few months into it being out into the world, I got this completely random message on Facebook uh, from someone in Tokyo who had picked up this book, an Argentinian barbecue, and they're like, hey, I love this book. Uh, It caused me to reach out to my friends and go look for an Argentinian barbecue place here in Japan. Uh, And I was just just, like mind blown. For for me, that was just such an important moment of like, okay, there are people who are actually picking these things up, reading through your words, and some way or the other, you're causing a change in people. And like that random message, like I, I literally remember not only the message, but the, the screenshot I took of it, the screenshot that I shared with everyone just meant a lot. And so I think that is one where it's like, not necessarily breaking in, but I think it's one that reminds me of, hey, what are you doing? What am I doing as a writer on a regular mm-hmm. basis? I love that answer. Uh, so with, with your writing journey, it's, it's hard to even pick a starting spot of what to talk about because you have done so many different things. And like you said, it's like starting over for each one. But since you mentioned the barbecue i want to start with your your food and travel writing side of writing so you know when was it that it dawned on you that obviously you were eating cooking food before you started writing about it so when was it that you decided it was time to start writing about these things yeah so i'll have to say uh there was this really under the radar rom-com rom-com that came out 2007 maybe called no reservations and most people might not have actually heard of it but I remember watching that and going home and cooking food. And I was just like really grilling potatoes and putting sour cream on them. It wasn't anything fancy, but I had a lot of fun with it. Um, that with Ratatouille, Ratatouille has been like one of those movies that like has really got me thinking about food on a regular basis. And I remember I was, uh, I just graduated with my major in finance of all things. Um, I was working in consulting and about six months in, I was like, this is not working out for me. Um, and it, it was a, a low moment for me personally. And I was using a lot of my evading work time, uh, cooking in the kitchen and starting like a blog. And it was like that kind of like a lifeline that I knew like, okay, this is something I want to explore. And so I made much to my mother's dismay, the decision, the decision of quitting um, after a year of working and consulting and traveling. And it was twofold. It was like, what about food is it that really excites me? And along that, can I share my journey with people who, whether for other constraints of privilege or cost and just time, um, aren't able to do what I was so fortunate to be able to do during that period. So it was started in Argentina and then traveling through different like culinary cultures uh, around the globe. And has food always been like a passion for you? Like, I, or, or did it something that just spring up and you're like, this is something that 
that I'm actually very interested in? Or had it always been something that you were exploring? Yeah, it had. I think my family has always been very food oriented, like food to us is just such an important thing. So food's been important to me personally for the longest time. Um, I have one anecdote of like, you know, in Boy Scouts, like when people go camping over the weekend, there were some scouts that like loved starting fires and there were some scouts that loved like the wilderness survival. And I was that weird scout that loved like, hey, can I take the dinner cooking shift? Because that Dutch oven uh, makes some pretty damn good food and I'd love to do that. And I don't know, I just, food was always something that was very interesting for me. And I think years later, trying to connect it back, it's kind of like the ability of food to bring people together, whether it's at a dining table for a conversation, it's just like, Food is a way, a vehicle of connecting with someone. And even the first book that it's, it's a food and travel book, but it's really about diversity of the subcontinent of India. And it's kind of like using food as the facade for, hey, can we talk about some real things that connect with food in a very loose way? Mm-hmm. And then we'll, we'll get back to the food too, but you keep mentioning travel too, and there is a travel element. So where did the travel factor into your, your growth as a writer? Did it come along with the food or did they develop separately? Yeah, I, I think just eating food, if you're going to write about it, isn't enough. I mean, there's culture and people, like lived experiences of every one of, every one of these dishes. And uh, again, fortunate to be able to do so. I was able to travel during that time, um, you know, working at hostels. I spent two weeks at a Chilean cow farm. Um, I was teaching English at a culinary school in France. For me, it was the traveling was important to understand the food and the food culture. Mm-hmm. And were these, I'm, I'm always curious, like a chicken, chicken or the egg question. Like, were you going to these places knowing you were going to write about them? Or did you just go there and realize, hey, this is something fun to write about too? Yeah, for me, it was, I was going there to experience it. But mm-hmm. I have always been a meticulous note taker. And nowhere, everywhere I was going, I was taking these notes. And at one point in Argentina, I was like, what if I just string all these little notes together and see what comes of it? So I think mm-hmm. writing was the byproduct of what was important to me was just like getting out there and traveling and eating. And was this where you started as a writer? What were you doing when you first began as a writer? Did it start with food and travel or did you start somewhere else? Yeah, it, it started as journaling, like just kind of a diary during, again, that, that low period. Um, I think I'd read somewhere that like, you know, writing is a, a good way of like having a therapy type akin experience. And so I was writing a lot. Um, and then writing while traveling was also happening. I wasn't really thinking of writing as a, hey, I'm going to be a writer at that po- point. Mm-hmm. Um, even after I put the ebook, I don't, I don't think it took me many years afterwards to finally start comfortable, be comfortable calling myself a writer. And even now, I think we have that. Uh, am I actually like, what am I actually doing on a regular basis? Like writing is like the smallest part of everything else that you do as an author. So, so do you? Let's explore that for a second. Do you consider yourself a writer now? Yeah. I, I, it took me, I think, only when the graphic novel came out that when I introduced myself, like, hey, yeah, I, I write or I attempt to write for a living. So yeah, it, sure. it took a while to be comfortable with that. Mm-hmm. I want to get back to your graphic novel in a second, but you have a, a food and travel book out there, too, which since we're on the subject, uh, Food of the Gods, uh, what was it that sparked this book? Where were you as a writer when you decided it was time to put it in between covers yeah it was i was doing that strange traveling thing at that moment and one of those steps was i always knew i wanted to go to india um for me india has always been that country that you know i've experienced as an outsider um you know ethnically i'm tied to the subcontinent but i've never truly lived there i've never really like been able to jump deep into like the culture the issues the politics of the subcontinent so when i was traveling um food was kind of like I wanted to know more about the food that my family eats and cooks, but also like every state has its own cuisine. Um, You know, the the Indian food that you eat at an Indian restaurant is only indicative of like a very small sample of what's considered like North Indian Mughlai cuisine versus there's so many different um, localized versions of dishes. So I was doing that. But I think it was also in the back of my mind going through whatever existential crisis I was like faith was an important aspect. Like I remember going to the old city in Jerusalem and I spent my three days there. Um, There's these two um, people studying, I forgot what the term is, but like one of the local universities. And I got to experience the city from their lens. And so like 
it was not only the food, but that, that faith angle and understanding, you know, what are the, the ideologies that drive other people and behold them to things. I'm not necessarily religious in like the traditional sense myself, but like being able to experience all these faiths was a very important experience, uh, uh, learning for me as an individual. Mm. So I think the book itself was just, sorry, it was just like an actual combination of, hey, food and faith. And I was very lucky to have um, Dave Long join me on that journey who did the photography for all the places that we ended up exploring. And did you have like a plan for that? Was this your first book writing experience? I guess let's start there. Yeah. Um, the, the idea of Food of the Gods itself was, I think, a year and a half journey. Um, I landed up in Delhi. Uh, I was working with Dave Wall and Hugh, who runs a commercial studio there for like branding clients. And we had always wanted to do a documentary. And the first documentary started with the idea of, hey, how do we dissect the history of chicken tikka masala or butter chicken? And we worked on that for six months and it ended up going nowhere. Uh, we had a couple of other ideas, like the history of food in India, uh, which also ended up going <laughs> nowhere. And I remember we had a phone call with someone like a producer at Discovery at the time. And about 15 minutes before the call, I was told that, okay, the guy predominantly speaks in Hindi, not English. And I, my Hindi has always been rugged to say the least. And so <laughs> we literally went through like a plan B option of, okay, what is another lens that we can explore, which is food of the gods, which is food and faith. And we had like a 10 minute like branding session right before this phone call. Okay, how do we say this in Hindi? Like what's a catchy name that we can say this in the Hindi language for the pitch? Uh, so we pitched it to Discovery and also nothing happened. Um, we went into our first publisher meeting with Harper Collins. Um, it was again, the plan B option. We had another uh, one that we wanted to do. They didn't like that. We had 10 minutes left in the meeting. We just pitched like, hey, we're working on this other idea. That's the one that caught their eye. But six months passed and that also went nowhere. Um, and so thankfully, we then took the idea. We went and pitched it to an editor at Penguin. And that was the one like they said yes to us. And there was like a month of disbelief of just like, wait, are we actually doing like what what stage of yes are are we at? She was like talking about like product dimensions and printing costs. I'm like, wait, does this happen before the contract? Does this happen after the contract? Is this actually happening? Um, and so it, it was a remarkable journey. We actually did the first chapter in between. So Harper Collins said they wanted a sap sample chapter. So uh, just uh, backpacking through Spiti in the, the northern mountains of India, we kind of just strapped together a bit of cash to fund the trip. Uh, we did the first chapter. Um, and then it was only after the book got greenlit with Penguin that we decided to explore the other places along the way. So you, you touched on this a bit. So had you written the whole book at this point or was it still in its like proposal stages? Yeah, it was a proposal of places we wanted to go to. Um, when we went to HarperCollins, it was just a proposal. And in the being declined from HarperCollins to going to Penguin stage is when we got the first chapter out. Um, but even then, like, I think one of the remarkable things about proposals is so much changes in the actual making of the book. So many of the locations that we wanted to go for wanted to travel to didn't happen we found new ones along the way um and so the proposal was remarkably different from the end product of the book eventually but did it i mean i, I this is probably a silly question because it you did get there to the point where it was out but did the book still keep along the same vision that you had for it yeah uh, what the core was always that that intersection of food and faith and i think at some point we pushed it too hard we wanted to just talk about you know um religion and faith like the food of religious communities and what we experienced while traveling is that not every religious community has like a strong food centric culture, but every community has this sort of intermingling of food and faith. So like the perspective ended up being broadened to a degree, which I think ended up meaning a lot more for the experience and the stories that we had to finally kind of dig out and share in the book. Mm -hmm. We might get back to this more later, but I want to I want to skip over to your graphic novel, which the cover is there on the wall next to you, Chotu. So where yeah, it's it is, <laughs> and it's a great read, by the way. Everyone, it's such a good story. Um, so where, like, as a writer, as a food and travel writer, where did you get the impulse to then pivot into such a seemingly unrelated medium? What was this, the impetus there? 
Yeah. So we had already ha- gotten our foot in the door with Penguin. Mm-hmm. And I was at the stage of actually living in India at this time. I do like two and a half years of failures. Um, found myself to like still be living with my joint family, which is a whole different experience <laughs> its own in Delhi. Um, but I was living with them and I don't know, it was like this outsider perspective of what India was to me growing up versus what India actually is now. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of it was the politics. And it was strange, the politics in India at the time was mirroring what was happening in the States of just people misusing politics for power. Um, and a lot of it mirrored what was happening in 1947, which was when India gained independence from the British. And it was a chaotic separation from that colonial rulers that led to the division of Pakistan and India. And there was so much that happened during that time that has left like imprinted biases in so many people living today. And it's passed on through generation. And I think that was like, for me, um, Chotu means it's like a nickname given to kind of like working class individuals who are called like small one is like the literal mm-hmm. translation. Um, and it's the idea that like there are all these small people, even I was feeling super small at the time. Um, how do I try to find optimism in it? Like what can someone who is small do in the world um, of the of this chaos, what, uh, politics and social issues? And Accordingly, I had um, a cousin who is a fantastic artist and I've always wanted to work with her. And so this became like a very amazing opportunity to actually work, um, develop the book together. And a lot of the foundation of the character is actually by our uh, grandparents. Mm -hmm. So um, they're brothers. So my granddad on my mother's side is also brothers with her granddad. And so it's kind of like that was the foundation who actually lived during Johnny Chalk during 1947 was the foundation of this character. Gotcha. And, you know, with the with the food and travel book, there was a, photo- a photographic element with this one. Obviously, there's the illustration. Are, are you used to writing towards an artistic medium, towards having a visual element alongside the story? It's interesting. I never thought of it as this is necessarily the medium I wanted to use for storytelling. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of it's actually born from insecurities as a writer like doing a book that has pictures or doing a book that has illustrations, I feel like maybe the weight was lessened on me as the person writing. And that's why I say like, when you ask the first question, you know, I'm embarking on my fir- first fledged solo project, which is just, just words, which is completely different. I think for me, it was so great to have an entry point, be working with someone on these projects. Cause like almost like that pressure was like, Hey, we're sharing and I got to go on this journey with someone. Uh, but what I found with graphic novels and comics and kind of like the short stories I've done along the way is the medium is so much fun to write and explore. And there's so much that you can do in a visual setting that you can't necessarily always do with the words and working with artists, like the amount of story that gets influenced by their art styles and how that story grows uh, when those like two minds come together is one of my favorite types of mediums to now work in. I wonder if you could expand on that a bit, because it, it's a very unique situation. Most writers do this solitary. I mean, they write their own thing and then see where it goes from there. You've worked a lot collaboratively. How, how does that, especially with Chotu, how did, how did it work bouncing ideas off another creative that was coming at it from a different angle? Was it a pretty simple process where it was just a back and forth? No. <laughs> yeah. It's hard. I mean, think about it. It's like you're trying to join two minds temporarily for 174 pages. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot that, yes, I'm doing as the writer, like trying to work on dialogue and the story and characters. But there's also, I went into the project thinking of Ayushi, the illustrator, as a partner on this this journey. Like for me, she was as equal importance and honestly, even more in the graphic novel setting. The illustrator holds so much more of the burden of the work. Um, So what was good was that from the very opening parts we bounced around ideas and I shared initial stuff with her which was good and bad the good was that we got to grow creatively together the bad was if you share initial like story arcs with someone who is not coming from a writer's perspective they're gonna be like wait this doesn't make sense at all Uh, so there was a lot of like I think I was over confusing her with overloading her information of what was going in my mind before it was ready to be digested by her Uh, but the same way like once she sent me the sketches of Chotu, once she had like the scenes and we decided on the art style, there was so much that I was able to take back to the writing. And I think for that made it so much stronger of a book. 
And, you know, writing a graphic novel script, it's a much different process than writing traditional prose. Did you have experience writing this before? Or was this all a learning process for you? Yeah, there was a lot of learning as I was going. Um, but those two years of failures, a lot of the work I was doing was in screenplays. So mm -hmm. I leveraged a lot of screenplay um, studies and understanding to work in a graphic novel script, which I think it is more similar to what you would write for a movie or a TV show than a novel. Um, and graphic novel scripts are especially hard because any revisions you want to make, like there is like any change that you have, especially early on, has a ramifications down the road because in a script, you're actually saying, okay, page one, panel three, what happens? So if you want to change a story element, if you want to change a single panel, like the entire arrangement has like a trickling effect of disaster afterwards. So there was a lot of learning. I remember me and Ayushi, we actually sat down we printed out what I had done, like story beats for every single page. And we drew, she drew them live in front of me as we discussed them. And it added six months to uh, the deadline. Like we delivered the book six months late, but it was just, I think, very rewarding of being able to work visually with her understanding the artist's perspective, which I think now helps me when I'm working on um, a script today. And one thing I always like to ask writers, especially with a book that has found some success, is was there a moment when you were working on this that it really felt special to you, that you really felt like this is going to be something different than what I've written before? Yeah, there was a few moments. I remember one, we were still in the drafting stages. Uh, we'd reached chapter four or five, and not to give out too many spoilers, but the character goes through um, a loss of someone important. And strangely enough, it was the same time I lost my grandfather, the one person that was actually the inspiration behind the book. Um, it was such a tough period. It was tougher for Ayushi because she was actually illustrating like events of the book that were strangely happening in parallel to us in real life. And I think in a way, Chotu and his journey, it's going to sound super strange, was actually helping us. Like the, the paralleling of the stories was so rewarding because it's like we already knew where Chotu was going down in the next chapter. And so we kind of had to hold on to that kind of that optimism that the character was finding for us to get through like a, a particularly dark moment in our lives. And I think that chapter, we made live changes um, in the middle of the drafting stage because there was just so much emotion and so much kind of just like the, the, the reality of it happening. I think to, that, to me, that's a moment where I personally felt like this book was going to be important to me no matter what happened. But afterwards, uh, when we were releasing the books though, um, uh, India was, has continued to have, but it was a moment of protests um, that hit in that winter, right, when the book was releasing. And it was protests specifically around the same thing, communal strife and politics. And at that moment, I was just like, it is so strange that we're writing with a historical fiction book of 1947, but we're literally seeing those events outside. Um, and me and Ayushi, we, we actually spent our New, Year, New Year's Eve after the protests, because it was just like, it meant so much more to us because we'd written the story. We'd seen like the harm that these ideologies can do. And was there a plan? Like you said, you already had that foot in the door at Penguin Random House. Did you, did, was there already a deal in place when you started writing this or was it all, all in development along the way? Yeah. Uh, we, we had started developing it thinking the Harper Collins deal was going to go through, um, which it didn't. And when we had that foot in the door of Penguin, I remember after a couple of meetings with my editor, after I knew for sure Food of the Gods was finally getting picked up, that I mentioned I've also been working on this other project. Um, and which is where we tar started taking it very seriously. Uh, the first rendition of Chotu was actually like a, a superhero story of like uh, this, this small monkey in the old Delhi area who like rises into like, uh, a coming of age story from a superhero lens. And I'm actually very happy we didn't end up pitching that version of the book. And I, I feel like the, the time gave us, the idea of the partition as the setting it actually changed drastically the project that we were working on. So I'm very happy in a way that we got to pitch the, the right version of the book. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure we're going to get back to Chotu as well, but I want to skip over to another lane that you've written in, which is in children's books. So you have, uh, a children's book series out there too, Elfie and the Peacock, where, again, similar, similar tract of questioning here, but where were you as a writer when you went into this avenue? Uh, this was the first of real writings. It was like uh, Food of the Gods had been 
greenlit, but it hadn't been released yet. Mm. Um, and we'd spent a lot of money on travels and the signing bonus and royal- that royalties, the advance given for uh, Food of the Gods was not enough to cover any of the travel costs. And we needed to make a little bit of money. And we actually talked to a hotel chain. So this was a commercial project, not mm. uh, like a traditionally published one. Uh, about doing a children's series based off of the mascot for the hotel group. Um, and again, this is particularly a very fun thing to work on because it talks about diversity, which is kind of like the motto, like a, a very strong lifeblood of this hotel chain um, who likes to like basically take um, people from all walks of life in India. I think, you know, you can say we have a problem of diversity in the US and I think that is to a different extreme, unfortunately, in India. Um, and so... They have um, everything from like, you know, a DJ who uh, does his spinning in a a wheelchair to uh, like major like drag queen events um, that like is such a large part of the hotel. And they were like, we wanted to take that that feeling and put it into books for children. So that was also so much fun to be able to do on like something that would actually have a profound change and people had a completely younger perspective and audience. It's interesting. So how much of a role did they take? And did they tell you what they wanted out of it? Or did they just say, have fun? As long as it's on this theme, we'll do it. Yeah, I think with commercial projects, stuff that are done for clients, it's a little bit less creative control. Um, Mm -hmm. We had very loose, like, hey, this is the character we want to base it on. These are some of the characters that, like the side characters that we want to include. Uh, But a lot of it, when it comes to how to actually work it out into a story and a plot, um, and the writing was kind of like where I got to sink my teeth in. And it, it was very cool because it's like Food of the Gods was already like two years into the development, but it hadn't come out yet. So like this one was that that right feeling and stage of like finally getting to hold on to something that I'd written, which is a, like a really rewarding experience of its own. It's, it's interesting because what it sounds like is you've always got all these different projects going. You're always pushing into new projects. How do you find... Two part question. How do you find the balance between all these different projects and how do you keep finding, I guess, creating your own opportunities to invest these projects into? Because it, like I said, it sounds like you've always got something going in multiple different lanes. So I guess let's start with the balancing act. How do you, how do you balance, especially being in so many different lanes? How do you keep track of what's going on? Yeah, I, I don't think there's a good balance. Um, I, 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 the genuine thing is, even today, I was sitting and doing some brainstorming on my journal and I was flipping through pages from about six months ago. And it, there's like a laundry list of like ideas and premises that I'd written down and I haven't gotten a chance to explore, see if they're worth anything. Um, I, I think you follow your gut on the ones that you want to jump into and sink your teeth. Like there, there's one that usually sticks out and there's honestly one that usually combines so many different ideas uh, that takes so long to actually make into reality. But I think for anyone who is writing understanding that publishing timelines, understanding that for a project to actually make it out into the world, it takes forever, uh, that you need to be working on multiple projects at a time because each phase of the project is so different. When you're doing your edits, those editing phases can be so grueling. It can be like, I do not want to read my words anymore. So it helps to have like secondary or third projects that you can take a step into. You can think about them and get creative again. Um, when you send out your manuscript to your agent and basically are waiting for feedback or it to be published to publishing houses, um, you are needing something else to do with my time and my mental energy and honestly the anxieties that come along the way. So I think having multiple things going on helps a lot with that. And and with the multiple things you have going on, I mean, obviously we're hitting the highlights here, but it sounds like every time you hit something, it ends up working out, even even if it takes a, a I was going to say, a, I'm sure there were some in between that didn't. So were there some that you were really excited about or that you'd really sunk your teeth into and that just didn't pan out the way you wanted? Yeah, a lot. Like we, we talked about Food of the Gods having so many different forms over two years and it finally came through. Um, with, with Chotu, we talked about how there was a completely different form and mm-hmm. it eventually ended up in this. But I don't think that's like the true reality of these projects. Like, Chotu only became this because there were so many different ideas that were kind of bouncing around, feeding into one. Um, there's so many projects that I've jumped into. Uh, I, I tell a lot of the students at Gotham, like for me, it usually takes about 15,000 words for me to decide, is this a book that I actually want to finish? And like 15,000 words itself is so hard. But what I think I have learned is you do the 15,000 words 
you understand and that gut or that instinct of being satisfied, like, okay, this is something I want to do, or this is something I want to leave aside. But what I also usually recommend is you never toss or delete any of that work mm. because future works always find a way of incorporating those things. Um, my most recent example was I wrote 15,000 words. I had a complete story outlined. I did not like, like I was not passionate enough to finish it out. Um, but there was a closing chapter um, a title of the closing chapter, which was all I have are these words and a theme associated with it. But I was like, I like that. And it took me 15,000 words to literally find a chapter title that is actually the basis of a book that I'm working on right now. That's at 60,000 words. And so it's just, I think that's just the reality of writing. So bringing all of this together, you know, one thing we often hear as writers, we have to understand that we're a brand, that we have to have a brand as a writer. So two part question here. First off, how do you feel like you brand yourself as a writer if you do? And second of all, do you buy that you have to have a brand? Uh, first part answer is terribly. Um, <laughs> it's something that it took me the second book to take seriously though. Mm. Um, I, I think there's this hope of, I'm gonna write this book, I'm gonna put it into the world and everything is going to change. And it changes for maybe two months where you have publicity events and you do guest speaking and you know people are reaching out to you telling you that they you they like your work and then two to three months later it's all back to normal um and not much has changed and i knew for the second book i didn't want that feeling of i could have done more um to be in the back of my mind which i think was the reality of the first book i just wasn't being enough of a business person i was letting that creative individual kind of drive when I needed to take a step back and be like, okay, this is something that I've put so much time into. If I want it to be successful, if I want people to actually read, read it and connect with me through those words, then I need to make sure I do all, all I can to get it out there. And I think that feeds into the second question. I'm not sure if it's necessarily a brand that you need to have. I do think the word branding is used because it simplifies who you are. Um, and I think, yes, having a clear message is in, in the business world is probably the best way of doing things. Uh, I, unfortunately, I don't have a clear brand, but I do know that I do have to, as an individual, do my best of bringing my book and my, these literally like the closest things I have to offspring. Um, if I want it to get out there, like I need to be a business individual. I have to make sure to push and bug people and do cold emails and like none of that changes. Um, you end up doing all that still, uh, no matter what stage of a writer you are. So speaking of the business side, now I want to talk about getting an agent, which is obviously such a big step in all of this. And especially given that you have written in so many different things, where were you as a writer when you got your agent? And what was that process like? Yeah, so I was very fortunate. And it's obviously the, the non-traditional way of getting an agent. But we had gotten our foot in through just sending the manuscript out to Penguin. Um, the agent reached out to us afterwards. Mm. Like, um, so my agent, Mitha, she is a foodie. And I think the reason she reached out was like, she'd also done so many projects in the food world. She loved food. When she picked up the book, she was like, I love this so much. Um, she actually invited us to her house and she cooked a meal for us. Like <laughs> she fed us before, like there was any business transactions, which uh, is a great way of signing authors now that I think of it. But um, <laughs> So very fortunate that after the first book is where she reached out um, and that's where we established our relationship for all the books going forward. Uh, and it, it's a non, not a very traditional way of getting an agent, but I think um, having one has been such a support system in a world where as a writer, you're doing so much alone. And I'm just going to let aside the business stuff. Like, yes, the business and the pitching, everything is great, but just having someone like who you can send your work to and to get feedback from itself, whether it's an agent or a community of other writer friends is so important. Um, I feel like as an individual, because I have stumbled into this in such a weird um, form, I never necessarily had that chance to develop a writing community, which is something that like I'm now trying to do. Um, but for me, it's so, like the agent became like that first kind of, Hey, I'm working on something. Can you tell me if it's complete nonsense or as, you know, should I keep doing it? And so, I mean, obviously it's worked out, but at the time, did she know that you wanted to go into all these other different, like writing a graphic novel, like writing a historical fiction? I'm guessing she's a pretty versatile agent as well. Yeah, you know, I feel like I need to have a conversation about it. I, I feel like when I sent her my historical fiction manuscript, 
there was probably a part of her like, what is this kid <laughs> trying to do <laughs> right now? I thought he was going to send me food projects. Um, she didn't turn it down. Um, it's currently in search of a home. So it's working out right now. Uh, but I'm sure, and I, I think the easier thing to do would have stuck to that brand. Like, hey, I've done a food book. You should do more food books. And I'm sure everywhere, and everyone from the agent to the editor would have preferred that. Unfortunately, like, I just have now fallen in love with historical fiction. Like, fantasy has always something been something that I consumed. Mm-hmm. And so, like, having that uh, historical fantasy type of a setting has just consumed me. And, like, almost all the things that I'm working on right now fall into that setting. So it's, yeah, I'm from food to graphic novels to a completely different space. But maybe that brand will come in the way, but maybe I just continue to just do things that, I'll say, sorry, I'm digressing a lot, but I think the most important part is to be working on something that you're so passionate about. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we spoke about this yesterday in class. It's like, you have to be passionate because if you hit that fourth round of edits, like, Editing and drafting is where the good stories actually come to light. Everything is nonsense until then. You can have the best thing in the world, but until you don't edit that draft, until you don't polish it and get feedback, that story is going to be not great. Sorry, I was going to say a bad word. Um, is not going to be as great as what it can be. So I think it's so important for you to be working on something that you're passionate about so you can push through the gruel that is publishing. So even if it's not the project that I should have been doing, it's the one that's like keeping me going. And, you know, you mentioned having to push through these rounds of edits and and the passion involved there, but there's also this thing that writers struggle with, and I'm sure you struggle with as well, which is this imposter syndrome that is obviously going to set in at at whatever point it wants to. How do you navigate, you know, imposter syndrome telling you something's not good enough and knowing that, yes, it is? How do you balance those two? That's super hard. Um, And I I think I, I hate giving these answers, but like there's a part of it that's just gut and instinct and you have to trust that. And, but that's why I say like, you can't know if something is good by just the idea of it. Mm-hmm. Like you have to put in enough into it to actually realize, Hey, does this have a place to go? And then for me, that's about 15,000 words. Um, and if I hit those 15,000 words and I still think I still want to continue working on this, that's what usually pushes me through the 30, 45, 60,000. Mm-hmm. And then another point usually comes where it's like, I can't read this. I am done with reading these words. I absolutely hate everything. And that's the point where I'm like, okay, now it's time to seek feedback. Now mm-hmm. the time is to send it to somebody else because I've lost objectivity and I am literally getting depressed reading these, these pages. Mm-hmm. I need someone else to tell me what they think about it. Mm-hmm. And so I think, using those milestones for me and trusting the process are very important aspects of uh, pushing through that imposter syndrome. Sure. And then uh, I want to ask about your historical fiction. Obviously it's not out there yet, but um, you mentioned it's, it's a big project because like you said, it's the first one that you've sort of gone on your own. It's not a collaborative process. So what was the process like writing that? What was the spark that kicked it off that made you say, this is the project that I'm passionate about now? Yeah. It was in part, it was something that's been in the back of my mind for so long. Um, And as most projects, it was like a year of an idea forming and swerving and changing and evolving. And then COVID hit. Um, And we were basically on month three of publicity events for Choto, the graphic novel. And everything just got canceled. And just like, wow, I have an entire month here. So it was that month I finally got to just jump into it and give it a shot. Um, And I think in a way COVID forced me to do that because there was not much else going on that I could do. Um, I had had time in my space. Uh, I hadn't planned anything further than what was going to happen next. Um, Traveling wasn't going to happen. So it just kind of forced me like, okay, now is the time to see if you can actually make this work. And so I spent a lot of uh, the lockdown um, actually just jumping into that manuscript. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the other things that we haven't touched on with writing in so many different mediums is having different audiences for each one. You're writing towards a different audience in each one. How do you how do you adjust as a writer knowing that, you know, for Elfie and the Peacock, it's going to be a much younger audience where it would show It's also it, I think it spans the audiences, but I do think it gears a little younger. And then and then your, your historical fiction sounds adult. Your food writing sounds adult. How do you how do you consider your audience or do you consider you just write what feels natural? Yeah, I 
I don't consider audience. I write for me. I'm going to say Elfie is the exception where I, I was told like this, obviously you're writing your children's book for an audience, but there's also, if you read that book, I had a, uh, a friend who actually read it and started crying. Like even children's book have such a profound impact for adults. Um, for me though, I think I'm writing for me um, and that can be good or bad. <laughs> There's not that many necessarily strange me's out there as well. So I don't necessarily know that audience is, but I think there's so much of an evolution that takes place as a writer. Um, and I'm continuing to not only find my voice and projects that I wanna work on, but I'm also continuing to find my audience along the way. And I think I'm hitting a point of, okay, I kind of know where I want to be in terms of that audience. I think it's going to be <clears throat> young adults to adults. Like it's, mm. I don't think children's books is necessarily where my style of writing and voice is going to work out. Mm -hmm. And then I want to rewind even further to the very, very beginning of your writing journey. So you mentioned that you, you were writing, you had a journal that you kept whenever you were doing your initial food and travel. Was that the first time you'd started writing or did it go back further than that? Yeah, I first time writing for myself would be that journal and mm. that like food blog that I'd started. Um, first time actually writing would be like a creative writing class that we had to take in college that I did very bad. Um, <laughs> so then yeah. I'm curious because I always like to find out like, what were you trying to accomplish when you first started writing? Was it just sort of a means to express yourself? Were you hoping that it would go somewhere or was it just sort of like a, a fun activity? Yeah. I mean, not to make this a sour conversation, I think, I was writing to help myself out of a very dark mm. place. So like writing to me was very intimate in that way. And I think for me as a writer, themes and characters is where I think about a lot. So I'm thinking a lot about what's happening in my life and kind of the, the things that I'm trying to deal with or kind of experience as a human being is probably where I find a lot of my inspiration now. So like, mm. even as I mentioned the graphic novel, it wasn't, hey, I want to tell a partition story. It actually started with the idea of, I want to tell the story of someone that feels small and mm. I was trying to help myself. Okay. How am I feeling small? What is like the way forward for me as an individual with the historical fiction? It talks about feelings and just um, things from anger to depression to like all these kind of like feelings, like what importance do they carry? How do we deal with them and how do we accept them? Um, and that's like where the magic comes in is like through the feelings that we all experience. Mm -hmm. So I have some more questions for you. We've got some audience questions coming in now too. So I want to ask yes, them. Please. First audience question. Uh, yes, keep the word. Speaking about how you don't delete anything. Uh, do you keep a snippet book like this asker asks their students to do? Yeah, I do. So I usually have this very unwieldy, unorganized, uh, either Word doc or journals. Um, journals is like when I'm brainstorming, but when I actually start writing, it goes mainly digital but I usually have one manuscript or one kind of document where it's like everything that I haven't liked along the way, everything that I love this, but it just does not work in the story. And I just kind of copy and paste it and hopefully come back to it. And it's very helpful to have something to come back to when it's like, I'm at the point I'm at right now, which is like, okay, what is next? I'm kind of like going back through my notes, like, okay, what are things that I've been thinking about? Have they evolved? What are some of the things I've written? Is there a, a growing point to kind of jump off of there? That was a great question. And you answered my follow-up, which was going to be how often do you revisit that? So thank you for that. Uh, next question. Similarly, uh, thanks for sharing your journey with such honesty. I'm curious what percentage, what percentage of your ideas end up getting discarded? It's really inspiring to reframe that as a necessary part of the process rather than as a series of failures. Yeah, I, I'm going to literally... So this is a page from my journal right here. And it's literally a bullet list of different topics and premises. And one, which is a line, which is a blank page and how on most days, this is my worst enemy was the foundation of something that I'm working on right now. But most of those other things are just ideas that don't have any grounding in anything yet. Mm -hmm. So a, a large chunk, for like almost any 20 ideas, one I grasp onto, but again, those ideas have such a strange way of feeding in different ways. Like if you need a secondary plot line, if you have secondary characters, um, if there's a scene that works, like these other things that you've always worked on and are always thinking about always kind of fuel into the larger body of work in some way or the other. Mm -hmm. And then one thing we haven't touched on directly that I want to ask you about is it sounds like you do such a good job of, of bouncing off of rejection and rebounding into successes. 
But how do you handle those rejections? I mean, as writers, we're always going to face rejections, no matter how successful we are. So how do you handle rejection? Yeah, I mean, that's coming at a, a great time because I'm literally in the waiting stage to figure out, okay, is my next project going to find a home or not? And it's been so tough for me individually. And it's just like, I never thought the thing that's going to like be like, the thing that anxiety in the back of my mind was worrying about a third book. Like I'm already so profoundly honored that I've been able to work on two books, but just like, I'm still yet here sitting. Okay. Is my third book going to have a home? And I, I don't know the answer to that right now. What I have been doing is trying to get lost in my second, like another thing. Mm. And I think that's the only way of working it out is that what I genuinely believe like the success of a writer isn't in one project. I, I think it's a new body of work. It's all the things that you're going to do now and continue to grow. So yes, this project might not work out right now. Um, but for me, it's like very important to remind myself to, okay, jump into the next thing. Um, because the more you think about and wallow in it, uh, it, it doesn't end up helping you. And mm-hmm. I, it's, I hate saying like turn your pain into something stronger because it's, it's so much easier to say that. And whether that's necessarily a healthy thing to do, I don't know. Um, But specifically in moments like this or moments where like something isn't going forward, always just making sure I have something else to jump into um, Mm -hmm. something else to latch onto. And maybe, you know, I feel like the 90,000, 90,000 word manuscript that I've worked on is the best thing I've worked on, but maybe the next thing is hopefully even better. Of course. So next question from the audience. You mentioned that you've scrapped several projects because you didn't feel passionate writing them. At what point did you realize that those projects were not working for you as a writer? Was there a specific moment or was it a, or was it a process? Yeah, thanks. Um, firstly, that's Terry. Thank you for joining in, Terry. He is actually part of my Gotham workshop. <laughs> um, so I appreciate, appreciate you being out here. Uh, yeah, I think it's a process. I think it's finding these ideas and I start usually from either a problem a character is dealing with, or I start with a theme that I want to explore. Um, And usually I spend so much time, okay, I have this theme. What do I add to it? What's, what's the other things to build along the way? And what I eventually come up with is just kind of like a wall covered in sticky notes. Um, I have like, I just throw everything into a sticky note wall and then I see like, okay, how can I tie things together? How can I make it fit? And then, that turns into an outline of just like kind of like story beats is what I think I call it at least of like, okay, these are potentially storylines. And then that turns into trying to hit that 15,000 word point for a body of work. And if it's something that I felt good about through all those steps, then I usually continue with it. If I hit those 15,000 words, that's probably the breaking point of like, okay, do I want to do this more? Is it something that I feel confident enough of putting in the extra work that's going to be now required. Mm-hmm. And then I want to ask uh, about your, your process as a writer, because again, that's something that writers often struggle, experiment, fail with. Have you always had a similar process as a writer? Has it been an evolving thing where you've just sort of been figuring out what works best for you or are you completely unstructured entirely? Yeah, I, I think I come from a very structured uh, point that it has evolved in a way. Um, back in India, I mentioned I was living with a joint family and I was literally next door to my grandmother on, on the, the same floor that she was living on. And so for me, then late nights um, mm. became, okay, I would push through into like 3 a.m. because it was the only time the world is quiet and it was the only time that I could actually focus on things. So I think that aspect of my routine hasn't changed. Like you find the time that you can to isolate because so much about writing is like, you can't brainstorm just like on the cuff. Like brainstorming usually takes time to get into it. Um, getting good with your characters and your plot takes so much time. Um, but a couple of things that I have started working on that helped me is try to do it a little bit at night so that when you wake up in the morning, you have something to work on. So it's not necessarily staring at a blank page in the morning. So I think that's usually more difficult. So it's like, have something that you're working on that you can jump into. And ideally on a good day, it's, it's harder and harder to find, but I like to have the first few hours of my day dedicated solely to writing mm-hmm. um, with everything from chores to uh, business things and emails. Sometimes that doesn't happen. But for me, the best days I've had is where I can wake up, make a pot of coffee and kind of just like, jump into an hour or two of where, where was I last night? What am I working on? 
that's probably the best aspect of the routine that helps me a lot. And then I have to ask, because you are, again, somebody who has written in so many different mediums. Do you have any mediums that you haven't gone into yet that you really want to? Oh, okay. I have always loved animated TV shows. Hmm. Um, like BoJack Horseman to me was one of the finest things to come out um, <laughs> of TV shows. And it was just, you didn't see it coming, but through those seasons, the way that show evolved and the, the thematic elements it hit, um, I've... I've loved that. I've always thought about it. Would so it would be so nice to work on something because again, animation allows you to do things that are so di- removed from real life. Um, I've always thought about doing something animated. Uh, I think that's the big one. I'd, I'd love to do that. I've always thought of. I don't know how it works. It's not an uh, industry I'm familiar with, but like writing the concept for a music video, I think would be very cool. Um, I don't think, I don't know if writers are necessarily an important aspect of that at all. Um, but I thought that'd be also like a fun type of a very different type of creative brain that's working to do something like that. Mm. I'm glad you mentioned Bojack. It's one of the best shows ever. <laughs> yeah, it was like, I was hooked. I'm a diehard fan. And honestly, you, the first few episodes isn't indicative of what that show became mm-hmm. and was able to do. Um, and I, I think a lot of that humor and the style of humor actually went to influence Choto. Um, mm-hmm. The idea of you can create characters of animals that are immediately relatable and have stereotypes, but then play with those stereotypes a little bit and under the veneer of humor to actually have like larger issues going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I kept, couldn't say it any better. <laughs> um, so last two questions I want to get in here. First one, you've given so much good advice here, but if, if there was one piece of advice you could give to writers who are trying to make it, who are trying to break in, what would that piece of advice be? Yeah. I think understanding that this is tough. And it is tough up until that first book and it is tough until everything after that. Like the toughness does not stop. stop. And I think asking yourself why you are writing, like is it coming from a place of, hey, I just want to be famous? you're going to be disappointed. If you're writing of, Hey, I want to be rich. You're probably going to be disappointed as well. Like asking yourself why you are writing and asking if you, if you are willing to go through all that effort and energy to see the project through. Um, but I think it's like, you can liken it to the tech startup world, right? Like everyone has the next billion dollar idea, but the company is made in the forming and the execution of it. And the same thing with writing. And I just know how long it's taken, like an average of two book, two out uh, two years per book to get it out into the world. And so making sure that your understanding of how tough it can be to put everything in. Um, and for me, the one thing that gets me through the toughness is every book has a part of something that I am working through. Every book has like such a strong connection to what I'm doing as a human being right now. And I think that's why it makes it important enough for me to finish. There's so many books that start off with like something I'm dealing with and the answer literally helps me in my own life. And I think that's when I realized, okay, now I want to write this to hopefully find somebody else in the world that's going through those same exact things and might benefit from this. That's great. Uh, And then last, but certainly not least, this is your chance to promote everything. Where can people find you online on social media? Um, And to listeners, this will all be included in the show notes. So everything that he mentions will, will include links to. Yeah. Um, firstly, thanks everyone for keeping through the past 56 minutes with me. Uh, I hope there was good stuff in here. Um, I have terrible branding, so I don't have any good marketing pitch, but um, Bharat Gupta, B-A-R-U-D-G-U-P-T-A across any social platform if you do want to follow. Um, I don't post much, but um, I do appreciate um, people reaching out and I do my best to respond to things. And other than that, I am heading over to the Center for Fiction on Thursday to actually leave behind signed copies of Choto. Um, it'll be the first bookstore in the U.S. that's actually carrying it. So if you have any interest in it, please do grab, uh, grab one. But yeah, I'm gonna, I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to add that to my calendar myself. <laughs> so uh, to all of our listeners, thank you for being here. Uh, we're going to be back same time, same place next week. Um, and Varu, thank you so much for being here today. This is such a great conversation. I appreciate you taking the time. No, I really appreciate you and Gotham having me. It means a lot. Of course. All right. So everybody, we'll see you next week. And thanks for being here. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye.